All right, in the middle of this big storm of videos coming out, I thought, why not do a behind the scenes on Tetsuan Iron Chan? Because I haven't done behind the scenes on a lot of my music recently, um, mostly because of the fact that I, you know, got a lot of negative reception to some of the ones that I did, just because, I don't know, people have weird reactions to people, like, analyzing their own music. I don't really know why, I don't really get it, because the people who like the music usually like that I talk about it, and so obviously like, you know, if it's something that I want to do, um, then there's no sense in not providing it to those people who want to see it. Uh, you know, I just get self-conscious, but I'm trying to get past that, so I'm gonna explain this song here, how it came to be, because I mostly, you know, more so than like wanting to tell the internet, though some people may be interested, like would like to chronicle the story for myself so that I'll remember this when I look back on this song later, uh, just because, you know, for me at least, it was an interesting experience. So, you know, this, what we're listening to, the instrumental of this song, is just the cardigans cover of iron man by black sabbath the cardigans is a band that is best known for the one hit wonder love fool the song that goes love me love me say that you love me fool me fool me go on and fool me in in this voice you know the one you're hearing in the background yeah so that's the cardigans and I had heard that song probably in my childhood, forgotten about it, but I was reminded of it because of my friend, Just Fern, who was going to, like, who asked me one time to collab on a cover of Love Fool, in which he wanted me to sing, and, uh... He was going to do all the instrumentals and sent me like some really weird instrumental ideas. I sent some really weird vocals. I think that probably, I, I think both of us couldn't really communicate to each other what we thought this, like what we thought we were trying to do. And so it just kind of got shelved. And, uh, but I became a fan of the song. I learned it through, you know, learning it for the sake of this project. And, um... You know, I think uh, probably like six months to a year after like making the attempt, I had like revisited the song and decided to look into the band that does it because I liked the song so much. I wanted to know if they had more stuff like it. Um, and so I downloaded their discography and the whole album that the song comes from, First Band on the Moon, is great. It is an excellent album. It was a total surprise. And the Cardigans are a band that is extremely multifaceted. They, their, their songs are more united by aesthetic than by, like, structure or style in particular. I mean, like, they play the same instruments in each song, I guess. But they'll, they'll, you know, they'll play them completely differently. I mean, this song is like a jazz, hip-hop, uh, like, lounge song, um, cover rendition of Iron Man. Um, it's extremely unique. And it's basically a meme. Like, on each of their albums, they would have a uh, Black Sabbath cover, like a super soft, gentle version of a Black Sabbath song, because that's hilarious. And their sound is super soft and gentle, but, like, but there's an edginess to it in that, like, the lyrics are all very dark and sarcastic. Like, imagine if Steely Dan was an adorable Swedish girl. You would get, uh, the Cardigans. So, like... I fell in love with this album um, back in like 2017 and then when May was hospitalized in 2018, uh, it just so happened that like on this one day, like basically like the worst fucking day where the sun was beating down and I was waiting around outside the hospital for hours, uh, Todd in the Shadows put out a, a one-hit Wonderland video about Love Fool, going in depth about the history of the Cardigans, uh, you know, talking about how badass they were, and I thought it was fucking awesome, and it was very helpful at that time, so it made my, my bond with the music even stronger. 
uh, uh, he and he also had you know highlighted the Black Sabbath covers. I, I mean, I've listened to all of their albums, <clears throat> and they're all good. None of them is like a bad album. This is just the one that vibes with me the most. Each one kind of has its own aesthetic. <sighs> There's one that's kind of like a harder, edgier album that has the uh, their other well-known song. I'm struggling to remember how it goes. It's like do do do. Do, do, do. I, fuck, I can't remember how the chorus goes, though. The video is uh, her in like, a, the fucking convertible driving through what I assume is supposed to be like Route 66 or whatever, because it's like that cliche, like the, the Great Nevada Drive, you know, cliche video. But uh, it's pretty sick. Would recommend. Um, but yeah, so I was listening to the radio I've I listened to a lot of the radio lately over the last year or so because like I'm really bad at keeping my like phone that's in the car charged particularly because I was living in the north for the last uh, for the two years prior to this past year um, and whenever I would leave my like old phone in the car that I use as an iPod um, it, it would die in the winter time because it would get too cold or in the summer it'll get too hot and then it won't charge because it fucking has overheated or you know frozen and I, d I will not remember to continually bring it back in and out from the fucking house so like eventually I got and I also I'm always trying to like I get sick of all the music on my phone and then I want to redo it but then I never do so like basically you know, all these things happened at once, and I haven't been using my phone. I've been listening to the radio. And since moving back to Virginia Beach, there are actually six radio stations that reliably play songs I want to hear at some point during the day. So usually I can find something I kind of want to listen to on the radio. Sometimes it's a real crapshoot. Sometimes shit sucks. But, you know, I, I have a fondness for, like, alternative pop music, of which there is much throughout history, and these channels play you know, decades worth of music, so, uh, there's, there's decent odds I'll stumble on something I like, and, um, some, I heard Love Fool recently, and I also had heard Iron Man on the radio, like, kind of within the same couple of days, and, uh, I think before that, I had heard War Pigs, and I had listened to Paranoid, so it was like, I had, like, I come home from the radio, listened to Black Sabbath, because I had been reminded of it from hearing it on the radio then heard iron man on the radio got excited about it thought about it thought about the lyrics when i was listening to it because iron man is a story about a a guy who basically goes beyond space and time and, and travels to the to through fucking the universe to save the future but uh like his the the shit that he went through has made him kind of insane and he needs help he has like ptsd but nobody helps him like they've all forgotten about him they're all afraid of him because he's made of iron like because he's completely shut out his emotions in order to deal with the ptsd uh and so like you know nobody helps him he just stares at the world plotting his vengeance and eventually you know at the end he gets his revenge it's basically the story of a school shooter um but yeah, uh, that is Iron Man. So it's, you know, it's really funny to take a song that is so edgy and hard and heavy and, you know, like one of the most famous metal songs of all time and turn it into this like really groovy, chilled out, psychedelic lounge jam, you know, um, with really pretty singing. But like, it doesn't necessarily not fit the song. Like, it's obviously done to be funny, but it still sounds like a reasonable interpretation of the, the, the lyrics because it's sympathetic towards Iron Man, you know, like in between the, the verses, there's parts where she sings, Oh, Iron Man. And it's like, it like, cause I mean, if you read the lyrics, they are an outside perspective. Has he lost his mind? Can he see or is he blind? It's all, it's all in second person, you know? So like, Whereas the the original song is sort of the tack of somebody who is, you know, righteously vindictive in the name of Iron Man, you know, who's like, Iron Man lives again, you know, like excited to see Iron Man wreak carnage um, because it's deserved because he was a hero and they shunned him. So fuck them, you know. 
this song is more like, oh, Iron Man, you poor, you poor thing, you know? Like, the, the world really did you wrong, didn't it, you know? Um, so it's kind of like, you know, a sympathetic lens towards Iron Man. So uh, that was at least my read of it. And I had been thinking about how I really wanted to, like, I have historically mostly made really hard rap music. And it's because of the fact that, like, rap music is largely about, like, taking a beat and commanding over it. It's like being the center of attention of the song, which is similar to pop music in that, it, like, the focus is on the vocals. Um, whereas, like, I come from a background of rock music where the focus is, is not on the vocals. The vocals are basically another instrument. And so, like, a lot of the, the, you know, music that I've made as a rap artist are, like, a combination of both where I am kind of, like, disappearing into the music, where I'm deliberately low in the mix, where I don't have command over it, or where it, I am desperately trying to get command over it, where... The reason that there's three layers of me and I'm screaming is because my voice is so weak and, and flimsy that it takes that much force for me to overcome the beat and that desperation is what people connect to who connect to the music, you know? It's the desperation to try to communicate and the failure insofar as I am stuck in the realm of music because I can best express myself lyrically um, and feel like the ideas are complete. However, you know, it, I cannot, I'm not good at like creating music. Like I'm not good at uh, playing instruments. I, and like, I want to learn how to do those things, but I've not had the, like, because of the fact that I've dedicated myself to a certain type of career that doesn't really leave me much room to like experiment with other forms of art. Um, you know, I haven't taken the time, I haven't set aside the time to learn how to, you know, in, engage with music in more ways than just vocally. And I don't know that I necessarily feel that I, like, want to. I would love to just be surrounded with, like, producers and instrumentalists who can, you know, help me to create songs as opposed to me having to learn how to do everything myself. And I have been steadily trying to make those connections, but it's difficult when it's something I have to treat as a side job. It's not something that I can, like, you know, unless I have people I really trust and really think we're going to make an amazing product together, I cannot give it all of the love and attention that a project deserves uh, if it's a side gig, you know? Um... And that's why I want to separate my projects so that, like, each one actually has a monetary goal. It's like if I'm going to work with somebody on a project and I'm going to set aside that time, there needs to be a way that I know we're going to get paid for it. And for that to happen, there needs to be some kind of marketing or some kind of structure by which the, the, the people who do like it can somehow fund it, you know. Um, and those things are not easy to achieve. So, like, you know, anyway, I've gotten off on a tangent. And the song is reset, so I'm going to try to get to talking more about how it came to be. So yeah, I was thinking, I basically was just thinking about how uh, I wanted to make cutesier music. Uh, that like, you know, for me, it's easier to, to be cutesier if I'm singing because my, you know, more feminine voice is a more sing-song voice. And like trying to be feminine and rap at the same time, <clears throat> like, <clears throat> I don't know. It's not that there aren't feminine... Rec I think when Beyonce raps, she has an extremely sing-song approach, and I really love the song uh, Savage, the, the Beyonce remix version, where she does these sing-song rap parts that I would love to get a handle on rapping like that. Uh, because, like, I don't necessarily want to sound hard as a feminine rapper. You know, like, for me, I, I, I'm, if I'm trying to sound hard... I'm going to use a guy voice because that's what I've been doing this whole time, you know, like it's really difficult for me to communicate to people that like I never saw myself as I never saw myself as a man in terms of like my conception of like I like my conception of who I am has not changed merely my description of who I am has changed. And so, in a sense, I don't feel like I'm a different person in any way in saying that I've been a woman all along. Um, it's like, 
I've taken advantage of the fact that I have a, you know, a male body to use the advantages of the male body, such as being able to sound cool or tough when rapping, even if, again, it takes, like, multi-tracking and screaming and all this kind of, and, and sound manipulation to actually achieve, you know, that sound. But if I was trying to embrace my, you know, embrace my feminine side and, and my more emotional side, rapping is not necessarily the best way to achieve that, but sing-song rapping can be kind of a middle ground, and that's what I went with in Tetsuan Iron Chan, which is an interpretation of how I relate to Iron Man, in that, you know, for me, my masculine identity is the iron shell. It is a shield. And I, I've been writing about this recently. I had this sort of, I guess, poem or lyric that I posted on Twitter a few weeks ago that I was really proud of that said, uh, like, I don't remember if, what order these were in, but I think it was skin of, or no, I think it was blood of magma, skin of iron, um, petabyte cyber brain, heart of silk. Uh, which was how I see myself. And I also had written a poem about the idea of having uh, a flexible shield that I can control and play close to the chest. Uh, sort of like an AT field in Evangelion or like the shields in, in Macross. Like, that's how I view male identity for me. Is that it is, as somebody who has a male body... And for a long time, didn't know what I could do about it, or should do about it, or wanted to do about it. Uh, the easiest way to make it through society was simply to embrace what parts of, you know, masculine identity I vibe with, and just like lean in on that and just disguise the feminine aspects. But, like, in presenting the masculine aspects of myself so often and not really having an outlet for the feminine aspects, I lost touch with that, you know, that core th piece of my identity that I had valued so much. And that's sort of what the theme of Gay and Dead is. That whole album is about, like, losing touch with your identity, being like, who the fuck is Conrad? I don't know. All uh, I am, you know... My soul, my gay soul is dead, you know? All that is left is this husk that it, and I'm, I'm just trying to enjoy what I can about this life as a, you know, dead gay. And, um, but I, I came back to life after that, you know? After I met May, she allowed me to express the emotional side of myself again, and I had to figure out how I could work that, that person that I want to be into my content because I don't want to be two different people. I don't want my content to be from a, a, a separate identity from my real self. But I didn't know how to reintegrate it effectively because I couldn't understand it completely um, because I had spent so long apart from it, you know, so long without being able to explore it. And when I was at the height of attempting to explore it, uh, you know, setbacks in my career caused me to double down on like let's stop like let's stop thinking about myself and start thinking about work you know and then i didn't stop thinking about work and then i lost the ability to make you know to fill my content with the emotional center that it needs because i was out of touch with my own emotional center in a way that i'd never been and like you know i had always been a winker and a nodder in my surface level content you know somebody who puts in calling cards to the people who are going to get it and then you go to the deeper content and you hear me talk about my gender dysphoria and you go okay i understand but then when i stop thinking about my gender dysphoria when i stop talking about it or ascribing it to it as an attribute of myself and i'm avoidant then it becomes confusing like why i'm even talking about you know the things i'm talking about anyway that's my iron skin that's boy mode you know is uh is the iron exterior so this is i i thought when i was thinking about that and um like i i crafted this beat if you will which is just the song like so okay my approach was like i wanted to make a cutesy song sampling 
uh, sampling the cardigans. I listened to Love Fool. There's really no part of Love Fool that was like open enough to 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 just like take and use as a beat. Um, but I the Iron Man cover, which I you know then saw, remembered I'd heard the song on the radio and had been thinking about it. Uh, has tons of spaces that can be used and looped. So I looped those spaces. And my original cut was only like two and a half minutes long because my instinct is when I make songs is always to just keep things as short as possible. It's just like, I don't want to dwell on anything. I just want to get to the point. Like, I don't want to have to write, you know, 10 fucking paragraphs of lyrics. I never think about the ways that I can just spread out the lyrics or rearrange them and things like that, which I did, did end up doing on this song as I'll get into, but, uh, you know, the, the original length was only two and a half minutes, but the length of the actual song, the Iron Man cover is 420. And I really wanted to preserve that because I, I don't know if it was intentional because not all of the other covers are 420, but it just seemed right. And, and, uh, you know, there are several artists I know, Fern, as well as, who, you know, again, introduced me to the Cardigans, as well as Frank Chavsi, have a habit of making their songs deliberately 420 just because they see it as, you know, like, well, that's the number, so, like, why wouldn't I use that number? You're like, you know, people, I guess, who are like me, who, who are very into following sort of cosmic guidelines, if you will, uh, you know, following spirit senses. So I, you know, looped segments of the song until I got it to a place where it was four minutes and 20 seconds and I thought it was perfect once I did. Um, you know, I just had to figure out which parts to loop and for how much and where to cut to the, you know, different areas. But yeah, it's just com like, it's just an amalgam of the song. Obviously the midsection, I threw a uh, gross beat filter on to make it all glitchy and fucked up because it sounds cool. And especially with the quote-unquote guitar solo over it that I'll get to in a bit. Um, so yeah, I just crafted this beat version of the song very quickly and then was listening to it and I thought Tetsuan Iron-chan. That just that phrase came into my head because I knew about the movie Tetsuo the Iron Man. Uh, you know, obviously also somewhat of a reference to the original song and, uh, you know, the idea that like k which is, you know, the light music club, uh, K, you know, K is like light on is music on short for ongaku. So, you know, k is light music. Um, this is tetsu on, so it's iron music. Uh, and I have the double exclamation point like season two of k -On. So Tetsuon Iron-chan. Um, it's titled like the name of an anime because I thought that would be funny and adorable. Uh, so yeah, it's this is the Iron Song of Iron-chan, essentially, is the way I would translate this title if I wanted to make it all in English. And uh, yeah, it's it's Iron all the way down. So, I had not actually seen the movie Tetsuo the Iron Man, and that's because I was afraid of Tetsuo the Iron Man. Because I am very squeamish, I am not necessarily into body horror and all that kind of, like, intense shit because it's too hard for me to sit through. Like, it's really funny because when I watched this movie, this movie, I had no idea what the themes of this movie were. I did not expect it to be, like, obviously about body dysmorphia and, like, you know, and, and sexual, uh, just, I don't know, like, repression, I guess. Like, it was a movie that I related to in a lot more ways than I expected to. And it was also just a dope, crazy fucking art movie. But, um, but, like, I was afraid of this movie because, like, you know, while it's obvious to me that, yes, like the body dysmorphia experience is what is being represented in body for horror. I literally am too afraid of that to watch it. And like, I mean, I'm afraid of most things, you know, I grew up of like not being exposed to any horror, not being exposed to any kind of violent work. So like, you know, through anime, 
I, like, e early on, I couldn't even watch, like, darker, more violent anime. I had to kind of, you know, mind bleach, mind bleach, mind bleach myself into being uh, interested in, in those shows because of what I got out, like, what understandings I was able to get out of them about the world. But I still really struggle to, like, anything that I know is going to put me on edge, that I know is going to spark my anxiety, that I know is going to get me thinking about, like, how shitty the world is... I try to avoid that kind of stuff because it will affect me for days, you know? Like, I really can't escape those feelings. And, um, you know, I, I do know that the more I engage with it, the more I can deal with it. And, like, I have been more capable in recent times. Like, I've been more and more exposed to just so much fucked up shit and I've gotten older and, like, you know... On some level, I do want to expose myself to as much as possible so that, you know, when I have to take care of children, then I will be able to, like, protect them and, you know, be ready for whatever fucked up shit is going to try to, you know, approach them, you know? So, like, uh, you know, I, I, I have always thought about YMS and his approach to, like, r slash watch people die as, like, a training tool to, like, learn ways that you can accidentally kill yourself um, so that you can avoid them. And it's like, I don't have, I don't have the stomach myself to literally watch people die just to like, you know, uh, for that sign of scientific purpose, but I highly admire it. And I would like to surround myself with people who do things like that. Um, you know, so in any case, yeah, I, I, you know, I watched this movie while listening to this beat on loop. Like, my thought was, I'll, I'll see how, the, how it feels, like, how well this loop connects with this movie, because if it doesn't feel right, then maybe this won't be the theme. But if it does feel right, then I'll go through with it. So I get, like, two minutes into the movie, and it's matching so staggeringly well that I cannot believe it. Like, because, again, I didn't understand what the, this movie was going to be about or like until I started watching it. And I was just like, it was vibing super hard. I was also high as balls, right? So I start up OBS and I record myself. I record the screen. Not myself. I don't have video. But I record the screen as I watch this movie. And I also have my microphone on recording. And so, like, I'm recording just the loop of this, this beat. Uh, over the film and then me singing anytime I felt like uh, like like the coalescence of what was happening in the film and what was happening in the song like that I could find a way to you know sing something that would match my projection of of that combination I guess uh, so you know here and there I sang throughout I my original plan was that maybe I would take some of these things and resample them in the song like go through cut the best parts the most fitting parts um, you know most of it was more loose singing not so much rapping there was like a couple instances of maybe a little bit of freestyling but like um, but like the movie ended up being a much more you know intense and somewhat emotional experience than I expected and I was kind of glad I had the music because the music is relaxing and the movie is fucking terrifying. Like, at least in the start, it's really violent and gruesome. And, like, it gets maybe more uplifting towards the end. Although its its outlook is kind of like, you know, like, our love will destroy this fucking world, which I definitely feel. But, like, I think it would have resonated me more with me more maybe when I was younger and more like, you know, feeling like, fuck the world, F uh, fuck it all, fuck this world, fuck everything that you stand for, dump it all, don't exist, don't give a shit, don't ever judge me. You know, it went back when I was that age. But, um, nonetheless, still a great movie, amazing weird ideas and crazy monster designs, and, uh, you know, even though I wouldn't say that I feel like the main character in terms of, like, what exactly emotions they are struggling with, um, I relate to, you know, I relate to the feelings, the, the core feelings of the experience. So, that's why I wrote this song sort of about my interpretation of, like, how I fit into this picture of this intersection of Iron Man by Black Sabbath... The Cardigans cover of Iron Man by Black Sabbath and Tetsuo the Iron Man. Where do I fit into that? What do I bring to the table? 
Well, the first thing I bring to the table is I am an anime person. I am an anime girl. And uh, so, you know, I wanted to reference the ultimate anime Iron Man, uh, someone with a similar name. Because when I thought Tetsuo the Iron Man, I also thought Tetsuwan Atum, who is Astro Boy, as we know, the, as we know him in, uh, in America, um, created by Osamu Tezuka, the father of all manga, who I don't, um, you know... I don't know what exactly was up with Tezuka's mind. I don't know what kind of, like, mental uh, typing I would put him in. I mean, obviously he's a new type, but, like, the Tezuka's... <sighs> Just the way that Tezuka's writing is, like, Tezuka's style and output and the kinds of people who are like that today is, like, Tezuka would just be seen as, like, a schizo-posting, like, you know, <laughs> like, maniac on the internet if, uh, if, if he... Like, I think a lot of people make a lot of assumptions about, like, you know, what just, like, the times were like versus what a person was like. And, like, forget that we like things not because they remind us of ourselves per se, but, you know, we're entertained by by certain ways that things are different from us. And, like, Tezuka, he's different in a really entertaining way. But, like, when you can recognize what the difference is through perspective of, like, the attitude of the work and what kind of people have that attitude, uh, you know, in the modern world, then you're basically like, Tezuka is, like, one of those just, like, you know one of those really hard-working autists whose work just eventually connected and just fucking rode the wave and just did whatever the fuck he wanted, but all he wanted to do was create. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of robotic dedication to creation as a way of projecting your ideas because you, like, you know, like, I don't know, I, I feel like Tezuka did not have any sense of self outside of creation. It's like, I can't express myself any other way. This is the only way that I can experience, like, my sense of self is through creation. And his last words were, please let me work. You know, as he died in, like, his fucking... I don't remember how old he was. But, um... Yeah, so... And he created, like, thousands of stories. So, you know... I, as a YouTuber, has made thousands of videos. Who is literally the human content machine. Obviously, I feel a lot in common with creators like, you know, Tezuka. I, I've always looked up to human content machines and people who threw themselves into their work because uh, it was, a, you know, for me, an escape from being the person I don't want to be. And as I become more and more comfortable with being myself through the outlet of, you know, being with people who respect me for who I truly am, um, you know, I'm more capable of not needing to work constantly and therefore can take better care of my actual health, you know, and like making sure that I am alive for longer. And also that like, I don't think that creations are necessarily the, the best way to reach people, you know, like I, I do think like I make YouTube videos that are very intimate and personal and I respond to my comments and I talk to my audience a lot and I try to guide my content in a way where I think that it's going to help all of us to understand each other better a lot of people understand me worse because they it, you know they don't connect with the other stuff i'm trying to say they want the more streamlined approach they want the more broad general stuff that i bring to the table um because that's all that's as far as they can connect with me and that's fine but like i don't value personally my ability to reach those people as strongly as i do the people who really get a lot out of my work because those are the people who I feel like need someone like me in their life the most you know like if you need if you find yourself like only listening to digi nay content because it's the only content you relate to enough that you feel like you know no matter how much of it there is you'll always choose it over something else because it's digi nay content and I understand this because this is how I feel about all the creators I like like I will always watch, like, any, anybody who I care about, I will always watch their content as soon as it comes out, just without fail. It doesn't matter how much of it there is. And, 
you know, in periods where people who I follow are extremely active, I am happy to get to watch all their stuff. But, like, eventually they start spinning their wheels if they don't have any new experiences. Eventually you're hearing the same things and you're not really learning more about the person or about the world. And it's because of the shutting out. And that's where I've been the last couple of years is, you know, I, I shut out my community. I shut out, uh, you know, other creators. I shut out... Uh, even, you know, consuming as much as I wanted to because I was too busy working. And my mentality was just like, work more. Well, you don't learn anything when you are just working. I mean, you learn how to work and that's fine if you're trying new techniques, which I did plenty of. So it's not like I didn't learn anything in the last few years. I learned a lot, but it's time for me to take those lessons and reapply them in a more useful manner towards like, you know, uh, both connecting with my audience better and living my life better. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. Um, so yeah, first lyric here, once I thought I was the wayward son of Tetsuan Adam and Tetsuo the Iron Man. So we also have a cross-reference here to carry on my wayward son, uh, because that was also a song I had heard on the radio that day. Um, and I, I was thinking about how the idea of the wayward son corresponds with the wandering son, the Hodo Musko, if you will, you know, a, a trans manga, and also just the song itself, you know, uh, you could easily, you know project a, a a reading onto it um even just the fact that it's used as the uh the, the recurring song throughout the show supernatural which is a a show that you know is popular with those types of people the lgbt crowd i guess you know all those things went through my head basically is i guess why i chose the word wayward son uh, you know, I thought I was a son is also a part here, you know, obviously I'm not a son. I consider myself a daughter, but once I thought I was the wayward son of Tetsuan Adam and Tetsuo the Iron Man. Tetsuo the Iron Man, again, as I said in this movie, is very much about somebody with, I don't know if it's necessarily gender identity specifically, um, the character that is, like, sort of representative of their id is, like, sort of gender ambiguous but wears a bunch of makeup and it's just kind of like this unrepressed you know like um sexual desire um but like when the character tries to shut out the feelings and the 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 femininity they become literally just like a tank you know with a giant drill dick so uh yeah uh so that's that's you know where i where i was putting myself is between these extremes of like this workaholic sexaholic basically you know um until i tried a softer hand and found i loved the texture of the sand so this is a weird one i mean trying a softer hand is obviously just a reference to you know be like in coming out and trying to be more feminine deliberately you know as opposed to like shying away from exploring my femininity instead going all the way and indulging in the femininity uh you know trying a softer hand has literal meanings in the sense that you know not only have i been shaving my hands along with the rest of my body and you know uh moisturizing sometimes but also that when i start hrt i will literally become softer and lose uh body hair so but finding I love the texture of the sand, I was thinking of the sand in terms of like an endless amount of small uh, connections, you know, like 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 when you pick up a handful of sand, like if you imagine that as like an, an amount of people, it's just like a huge number of people, you know, and like like interacting with the sand is like. Like, like, what makes sand such a pain in the ass? Because, you know, I've grown up at the beach, so I've had a lot of interaction with sand throughout my life. And I always hated the beach growing up because it's like you get dirty and it's a hassle. You have to wear sunscreen. You have to prepare. And what is it all for? You know, for me to feel insecure in my, uh, you know, uh, not wearing as much clothes as normal and, you know, feeling like I look weird and also like, you know constantly like having to avert my eyes away from girls in swimsuits so that i don't get like a weird boner or something uh you know not the most fun in my mind but as an adult i don't care as much anymore i enjoy the beach more and you know i also kind of was trying to imply that in in, in becoming softer myself embracing the femininity within myself i don't necessarily need women to be as feminine for me to be attracted to them 
and you know i i find myself more more attracted to men than before not to the point that i would say i'm attracted to men because i only really like pretty boys who look like girls anyways like what i'm attracted to is basically like somebody being like soft enough to understand me but hard enough to also be like you know more aggressive than me i guess like more mass like i like to i like women who are more masculine than i am basically is what i'm interested in certainly more athletic than i am um so yeah so i was thinking of that as like the texture of the sand as well um a brand identity was never meant to be the way you looked at me so yeah like this is again commenting on the digibro persona that like you know when i started as digibrony digibrony was a character insofar as I did not try to like forwardly insert my identity into my analysis of the show. I considered it to be like, you know, there's a personality to this character that is indicative of the person behind it, but I am not trying to be like accepted for being who I, who I am at like my core in these videos. Uh, but as time went on, and I tried to like find things to say about the episodes because like season four, I had already said enough about the show. I really hate repeating myself. You know, I, I as much as I do it, <laughs> as much as I incidentally repeat myself in the effort of trying to make different versions of the same points, uh, I hate deliberately knowingly repeating myself. So like if I watch an episode of this show that I'm covering every week in order to make money as my job, and there's nothing new to say about this episode, then I have to, like, reach really deep into, you know, into talking about maybe uh, higher literary concepts or about more personal ideas or getting more into the nitty-gritty of dissecting the quality of the show. And in certain episodes where that was all I could really rely on because I didn't have any ideas about the themes, like, of what I could say, you know, there were certain episodes where I would kind of you know really break down why it wasn't that good and like it would piss people off and they would be like oh you're negative about the show you're harping about stuff that doesn't matter and people would just kind of not even really focus on the stuff that i cared about in the videos and so it felt like communication was breaking down and so i made this hard shift where i changed my character completely to just being my actual natural self uh which was edgy as fuck and i my character started smoking and had dark circles under his eyes and I put them in a bar setting and I talked about my personal connections to each episode and I didn't talk about whether the episodes are good or bad. And as I've said before, you know, my audience fell, my Patreon increased and I decided this is the way forward. But I've had this stumbling road the whole way through my anime career where the more I, you know, the more I tried to grow and the more I tried to appeal to people and be a YouTuber and like, you know, follow the path of like trying to figure out what will appeal to the audience the more i lost track of like what i actually want to do and became more and more ashamed of anything that i did that didn't get attention you know that like oh well you know nobody likes my music so i'm not going to work on my music as much as i want to i'm just going to try to like bowl through each album in a day because like you know i know that nobody's going to like it and it's not going to pay off so like i'm not even going to try to work on it you know um and that like unfortunate mindset has held me back in like the speed at which I have developed as a musician because I just haven't put as much time into it as I should and not out of lack of desire to do it but out of convincing myself I can't even though I'm the one making all the rules you know so you know this brand identity that I formed ended up being who I sort of am and certainly the way that I was looked at and uh, it was never what I wanted because I'm not interested in being famous. I'm interested in being understood. So here I say, fame upon my name is less than worthy as a novelty. You grovel to constituency, let them have your innocence, and in a sense, you never get it back. So, you know, I'm saying that, you know, in trying to become famous, in pursuing that, even if it was just as a way that I thought would make me more money... Um, or would broaden the scope of people who would find my more obscure content. Just worrying about it at all requires some level of trying, like, you know, of, of subjugating yourself to the attempt of appealing to other people. And it's not that I ever overextended myself in trying to do that necessarily to a degree that it became too painful for me. 
It's more just that I am like so bad at it that even trying so hard for so long has been a mistake. Like spending so much of my time tr convincing myself that I could be cynical enough to like become famous and make more money has been a waste of time because I'm just bad at doing that kind of content and I can't bring myself to it and like lying to myself about it isn't helping me, you know? Instead, I should be trying to figure out a way that I can do the things I want to do for the people who want me to do those things. And even if that means making less money, then, you know, that just means I need to cut back on my lifestyle, you know, and not smoke weed all the time, which I'm obviously doing only because of the stress of, you know, putting myself in this position in the first place. And really, it's the fear of the fact that I have tax debt that is still unpaid, that has mostly kept me feeling like I have to try to find some perfect formula for working the hardest I possibly can. But like, again, it just hasn't worked. So like, you know, rethinking the career into something that makes sense is more important. Again, I'm. whenever I make these videos, I just start talking about the stuff that I've been thinking about. I mean, obviously it is relevant, but um, you know, I'm really talking more about stuff I've thought about since writing this song than stuff I thought about before writing this song, but that's how these things tend to go. So yeah, you grovel, you let them have some of your innocence, and in some sense you can never get it back. But you know, at least you'll have learned from the experience. Now originally there was a second whole stanza to this first verse. The mind bleach, mind bleach part was only going to be at the very end originally, um, because I only came up with it at that point. And then I didn't really like the, the other half of the stanza, because even though the flow was fine and the rhymes were okay, um, it was kind of too similar to the verse before, and also it was basically retaliatory. Like, basically, I go from, alright, in a sense you never get your innocence back, so that's why I'm going on the attack. You know, it wasn't literally that, but it was like that, you know? And that's why here I'm saying I ain't trying to be mean, because, like, it was continuing from a part where I was kind of, you know, saying, like, an implication that I was going to be mean. But I just didn't really like it as much, and I loved the Mind Bleach chorus, so I was like, alright, well, I'll just repeat that back earlier in the song, and it'll be better. Uh, and then we won't have so much of the song be retaliatory, because it's not really a retaliatory song that's just kind of a, you know... It's kind of a fallback for filling out a rap song to just be like... Oh, by the way, you know, here are the parameters by which if you were to cross these certain lines morally that I hold dear, then uh, I would retaliate and I would sick my crew on you and I would do things to you. Usually steal your shit and fuck your bitch, which is exactly what I went for in this song. Um, so we'll just go straight to that. I say, I ain't trying to be mean unless because of cream, you choosing who to cream, then you're going to meet my team. So this is a kind of complex reference. If you don't know what uh, cream with the period stands for, it's a reference to Cash Rules Everything Around Me, the Wu-Tang song, Cream. Um, you know, cream get the money, dollar dollar bill, y'all. So because of the fact that cash rules everything around me, the people who have cash are able to choose who to cream. In this case, I both mean to be violent towards and also to come inside of, because obviously these are the two things that the people with the money do. They choose who to cream. And so if because of cream you choose who to cream, then you're gonna meet my team because we're gonna stop you from doing those things. And I bet your scream will sound good in a sample. So this is, you know, my version of steal your shit is always that I will take it and reappropriate it into art because you know, I mean, we're on a Plunder Phonics beat right now. This is literally just, you know, an Iron Man, this is just an Iron Man cover uh, on loop. Um, you know, I, I am stealing your things and resampling them and making them my own. So your scream will sound good in a sample, which I will bounce my ample thighs up and down in tandem with your bitch on my mantle. So, yeah, I'm saying that I'm, I'm going to, you know, bounce on a dick to your song in tandem with the thrust of your bitch um, up on my mantle. But then I'm gonna nut in that hoe because I still have the ability to do that. Steal all her clothes and leave you raising my clones. And as a result, household IQ jump up dumb high. So, you know, IQ dumb high is this fucking meme that's 
I guess, popular with the kids right now. I learned about it from the Unknown Otaku, putting it in the description of the podcast we did together, um, and then explaining it to me. But yes, yeah, the the IQ 189 Dumb High. Um, I won't explain it in any more detail than that. You can look it up, but I think it's fucking hilarious. So the implication is that because of the fact that you are stuck raising my children because of the willful impregnation of your wife, uh, your household IQ has gone up because of my seed. Um, you never see these eyes. I watch it all from the skies because I've, I've been heavily into the bird Sona, uh, shit lately. You know, I'm, I'm vibing with birds and, um particularly the eastern gray uh eastern gray owl is it just a gray eastern gray screech owl the eastern gray screech owl uh i said western on a podcast before and that was a mistake i meant the eastern one eastern gray screech owl um so you know you never see these eyes because i'm watching it from the skies uh, so then there's this guitar solo in the middle of the song, as I'm calling it. Uh, it's actually just me singing. It's just me singing normally. However, I put it through a guitar filter. Particularly, I think it was the Dark Stoner filter, which is, uh, you know, like a heavily reverbed thing that is similar to what, you know, bands that try to sound like Black Sabbath would probably use. So that was my thinking behind using it. I thought it sounded great. It sounded like a noise guitar solo. It sounded kind of like Boris in my mind. And you know, Wada from Boris is my uh, my one of my greatest female role models. So I was very happy to pay homage to her guitar style with my voice. Um, so then we come back in. And this is the part where I, I have this tendency maybe just because I am insecure about my own rapping and the fact that people that I always expect people to hate it I kind of like address the fact that I expect you to hate it before you can even say anything so here I say did you want to hear me bust about a hundred words a minute like Busta Rhymes were you hoping I would hit the full falsetto in a weird attempt to sound like Grimes like you know maybe you were hoping I would go even girlier with my voice um, which I do at the end of the song anyways um did you know about the hours and the hours that were thrown away and died? This is just in reference to just the amount of time that I've either wasted or spent on things that didn't end up coming to fruition and just the the sheer amount of my effort mentally that goes towards things that just never see the light of day or matter and you know and i cannot account for and uh you know they just it's just hours that i died will i ever find a gentle uh, way to tell someone to go fuck off and die and this is because like for a long time when i read hateful comments it's like I, my knee-jerk reaction is just to type like fuck you go die like fuck you kill yourself you know like just go just please leave me alone and like i never will type it because i strongly feel about you know i don't want to encourage anybody to commit suicide because if they actually are suicidal and i you know encourage that i feel really bad you know um so like you know i'm trying to work on how do i how do i take an approach that i feel comfortable with but still asserts my position you know and like you know not just in the case of like haters but just anybody who i'm dealing with like just how do i get past my like knee-jerk reactions and like hone my ability to communicate with people so i can do it quicker and have more instinctual reactions you know like i have a tendency to give up in social scenarios because it takes me too long to figure out what i should say so i just don't say anything um and on the internet it's easier to practice that but I have a tendency to, if I can't think of what to say, like, right away, then I just give up. And, like, I... What the fuck was that? I want to try getting back to people more often, basically, is what I'm trying to say. You know, like, like thinking about it and then coming back to it. Uh, anyway, mind bleach, mind bleach, mind bleach, bring me back to the person I used to be, babe before you knew me, babe before I threw me away. This is, you know, just about my transition, about wanting to be... The person who I once was, who, you know, it's funny because I think that when I was a kid, I was the worst. I think that, like, all of the things that I've learned how to not be are, like, the things that I was 
more like when I was a kid, but my intentions were better. Like, when I was a kid, I sincerely wanted to be the best person that I possibly could. It's just that my understanding of how to accomplish that was very different from everyone else's, and that was my frustration. And now that I feel as though I, I understand how I can be the best person that I can be, and I feel like confident that I can do that, I feel like it, I'm returning to who I used to be and that like I am matching my intentions better in the way that I carry myself, but that like I did not know how to reflect my intentions properly uh, for all this time because, you know, I just couldn't figure out like how to interact with the world in a way that would reflect what I wanted, like who I wanted to be, how I wanted to be seen, you know, uh, but, you know, and here I'm saying, mind bleach, mind bleach, mind bleach. I was never supposed to become the thing that I let consume me. Can you help me pull it away? Can we try to be friends this time? So, you know, the idea is that, like, in, in like, performing a male character, in, in like, becoming estranged from my emotions, in increasingly becoming insecure, or even just forgetting, you know, like, what I used to care about, and worrying so much about work, and spending so little time really engaging with my emotions, or even engaging with other people's emotions, even just through art, in order to have more to say about myself and about art, you know, um, through all of that, like, I, I ended up, rep like, repressing something that I once had as part of my identity, and... It's like, I became the meme, as I put it, on uh, Gay and Dead, you know, uh, and I was never supposed to, so now I need to pull it away, and the only way I could do it is to let other people help me, uh, by becoming friends, even with the people who maybe I pushed away in the first place. So, yeah, that's it. That is pretty much the meaning of Tetsuan Iron Chan, the way it was created, the meaning behind the lyrics, um, the drawings... You have Iron Chan, who, like, you know, I was just listening to the song and thinking about the title, and I thought, wouldn't it be cute if there was, like, you know, because of this song having kind of a clockwork feel to it, what if there was just a little dancing version of me, uh, you know, uh, in the corner? And so, initially, I was just drawing myself. It wasn't necessarily intended to be a character that is Iron Chan, but because of the way that the dress and the hair came out, I really liked the idea that, like, this is an iron-haired girl. Iron hair, iron eyes, you know, um, in this red dress dancing around. And so she became Iron Chan. Um, but, yeah. So I drew the two frames of animation um, that are looped throughout this video. I'm very proud of the drawings and, and the animation itself because it actually kind of works. I was really worried that the proportions would fuck up or uh, scaling would fuck up, but no, it looks appropriate. Um, you know, I just did it freehand. Uh, the second frame I vaguely traced over the first. Um, but yeah, I just, the colors were just the Sharpies that I happened to have on hand. So, uh, cause I wanted to be like really bold, dark colors that would show up on camera or uh, show up on, you know, after scanning them into the, the video, you know, it couldn't be colored pencil drawings. Cause I knew I was going to overlay it onto Tetsuo the Iron Man footage that was colored pink. And initially, you know, I mean, I took the footage clips from the recording that I had made. I didn't really overthink it very much because pretty much everything in the movie fits the song. So I just pretty much grabbed the earliest scenes I could. because I didn't want to show anything too fucked up and I didn't want to, you know, I couldn't show on YouTube. And, uh, or that I just didn't want to subject my audience to. And, uh, I also just, you know, didn't want to spoil the movie too much. I wanted it to make people curious about the movie. So... Uh, yeah, I chose mostly early scenes, um, with one exception that is oblique enough that you wouldn't even realize it was a spoiler. But, uh, yeah, um, and then I put lyrics over it anyways, and, I don't know, like, in the editing bay, using the blue and orange looked fine, and, uh, in the process of trying to create the parts where it, the, the mind bleach parts, because I drew the image of the mind bleach because I thought it would be a funny meme. It says, fed, tested, schizo approved on it. Um, and it's a gallon of mind bleach. 
And uh, when I did the parts where it alternates back and forth, up and down, I had to move around some of the clips of Iron Chan dancing in order to make her be on the correct part of the screen at each time. But I didn't pay very much attention to like which images I was moving around. So it causes these moments where like Iron Chan kind of bounces around the screen in a jarring way that breaks her pattern that I think is annoying. And also I did not get the sync just right. Like. I did not go through the whole video and synchronize every single, you know, movement of Iron Chan. I tried to duplicate it across the song, but there are places where the, like, you know, where things desync a little bit. And ultimately, like, watching the video is kind of annoying for me because if I pay too much attention to Iron Chan, then it feels like the beat is off or it feels like my vocals are off beat. There's just too much to pay attention to happening at the same time and it feels too chaotic because of the lack of mastering in the music. It just draws attention to it. It splits your splits your attention among too many things and it makes the flaws in the song more apparent. It also doesn't help that YouTube's compression makes the audio sound worse. The Bandcamp release sounds better than the YouTube one and it's easier for me to listen to. Um, but yeah, also looking at the video, I simultaneously love it in terms of like what I was trying to accomplish, but I definitely think that the stumbles, the stumbles along the way in both the production of the song and in the production of the video do make it difficult for me to enjoy if I fixate on them. But like conceptually, I, this is one of my favorite songs I've done. Uh, you know, there's a lot of meaning packed into it. It was a lot of fun to make. I made this, oh, by the way. I forgot to mention this. So the way that this song ended up actually getting made is that I had taken May to her hair appointment because she literally was getting her hair bleached. She was getting her like bleached uh, highlights in her hair so that she could have it dyed pink, uh, which would happen a couple days later. And she had to be in the hair salon for like five and a half hours. So I came home from dropping her off and literally spent that whole five and a half hours just making this song. like. And I pretty much finished it right before, well, I had thought I had finished it before I went to go and uh, pick her up. I ended up recording afterwards another pass through of the vocals um, that is mixed with my original pass throughs in, in the finished version and, um, you know, maybe adjusting the volume on some things. But like after that it was finished and then I spent the rest of that night when she was live streaming, uh, drawing the animation and... Uh, then later that night creating the music video and I had it out by like five in the morning or some shit like that So yeah, it was all made in a day um, and I was honestly like the amount of time I spent working on it is equivalent to how long I have spent making like five tracks in a row before you know so like it was an especially large amount of work for one song for me partially because of how long it is and partially because I was kind of trying to get it right and make it good, you know, and like make it something that I'd be proud of. And I do feel that way, but it does have a lot of blemishes. Like I do wish I had spent even more time on it. Um, and it's not that I don't think I could still fix certain things, but it's more just that like, like the things that would make it sound perfect are things I don't know how to do. So it's like, I could tinker with it and make it sound better, but I'm never gonna make it sound as good as I would be happy with with my abilities and uh maybe somebody else could make it something i'd be happy with but i don't know <laughs> you know um so i guess if you are interested in trying to remix or remaster this song um hit me up on twitter or uh on my anime list in the or dms and you know if you want the stems for the song i can send them to you if you want just the instrumental or if you want that video of me watching Tetsuo the Iron Man with this song on this beat on loop and singing over it, I could potentially send you that. I don't know if that's interesting or watchable or even if the uh, even how audible my vocals actually are because uh, I haven't listened to it back. But uh, it exists. So, yeah, um, the song itself I released for Pay What You Want on Bandcamp. Um, you know, I don't technically know if I'm allowed to sell it because I don't know what is considered fair use. I mean, like, I don't think I'm allowed to sell it because I have not cleared this sample, but I consider it to be, in my mind, like, enough of a, a different song that it would not, you know, it would not infringe on the sales potential of the original song, um, you know, 
if they gave me a cease and desist, I would obviously comply, um, you know, and refund or pay to them any money that I made off of it if that was, like, what I had to do, I guess. But, uh, you know. Um, I felt like it was an original enough song that if somebody wanted to give me a dollar for it, then that was, like, fair in my mind. But, uh, maybe not. Uh, alright. Yeah, this part at the end, you know, somebody, some, I, some people are unclear that this is not me singing. This is from the original track. I'm just kind of singing along with it. I was kind of trying to sound even girlier and more effeminate so that it would be kind of like that, you know, I wanted it to be like that I was being like intimately involved with this voice, uh, but as the even more effeminate voice in the relationship. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's pretty much all that I could possibly say. Thank you for listening, people who enjoyed Tetsuan Iron Shan.